All right, good morning. We'll uh, continue to give everyone an opportunity to hop on this morning, but I'm gonna be respectful of everyone's time and we're gonna get started. Um, welcome to Missouri Public Transit Association's education series on succession planning um, from an organizational perspective. My name is Travis Wood, Senior Program Manager at MPTA. MPTA's provider members uh, deliver more than 47 million rides every day in Missouri, employ thousands in our communities. Um, I'd like to welcome MPT board members who are joining us this morning. Um, thank you for attending and thank you to all of our members who are moving transit forward in Missouri every day. Um, our goal with today's discussion is to provide you with an overview of the importance um, and the process of succession planning um, for organizations in the transit sector. Um, we're lucky to have an expert on the topic with us, um, Karen Sousa, Deputy Executive Director and Human Resources and Training Certification Director at CTAA. Karen has extensive experience as a leader in human resources, membership, professional development, training, and much more. Um, she'll be walking us through what can seem like an overwhelming process for organizations, including what it takes to, to undertake a successful succession planning process, internal development, knowledge transfer, uh, measuring success, and more. Um, following the presentation, uh, we'll provide some time for Q&A. Um, as a reminder, you can share any questions or comments um, that you have via the chat box or Q&A tab um, at any point during the presentation. I am going to stop sharing, and without further ado, Karen, I will uh, turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Travis, and so happy to be here with all of you, and I'll get my screen sharing going here and get us ready to begin. I'm so happy to talk with all of you about this topic. Um, it's certainly based on my experience working with uh, transit agencies um, who uh, have, as you are here today, um, recognize that for many of you, you've come to a point not solely in terms of what you're looking for at the executive director level, but the length of service that surveys have shown on transit agencies across the country that about 15% of agencies today have any type of succession plan. And many of them are coming to the point as I look at some of you as members of ours and your agencies are at the point where someone perhaps who's been for many decades leading that agency and having a senior leadership team at that level um, are recognizing that they want to ensure that the good work that's been done and the commitment to the community and working with their board is allowing to have a not only a timely but most critically a well-developed plan about who's going to come forward whether it's internally whether it's looking externally and internally and also if you have to do an external look for an executive director level. But succession planning isn't solely based on the executive director, general manager level, but it's about looking at the overall critical positions of leadership within your organization. Whether you're large or what you might identify clearly in rural agencies as smaller, and perhaps not as many structured tiers and positions in your agency. Um, either way, the retention of and transfer of knowledge that either one person in many cases, um, or perhaps several are responsible for, and even at the top levels of an agency, the overall process that we want to have in place for succession planning fits in and is always a part of those of you who have a strategic plan, or if you're also at the point of being in the middle of a strategic planning process, it clearly makes sense that succession planning and strategic planning for an organization are, are meant to support and be connected to each other. So with that brief overview, I'm going to identify five aspects of a successful succession planning process. The first one that I'm sharing with you is identifying critical key positions 
and the competency required of those senior leaders. That might mean that you're even starting at the point of, if it's a job description you've had for a long period of time that has not been updated for someone in a key leadership position, that might even be part of your process. But step one is identifying critical key positions. The next step as an overview is assessing the internal leadership potential talent. These conversations are held with senior leaders and many times it's engaging people that are in positions, again, not identified that way in a title, but these leadership positions throughout an organization is something that we want to assess the kind of talent and competencies that we're looking for there. The third overview point is it's going to mean developing a way to retain the talent that we have and the way to retain using resources that will include specific ways to coach, mentor, train, to bring about continued professional development in your succession planning process. The fourth part is wanting to capture, as it's called, and transfer knowledge of key people in your organization. And that knowledge transfer many times means that we have to have identified plans that we outline the steps to allow that knowledge transfer to occur. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone who's had someone in key positions of leadership for a long period of time that they've developed certain processes or certain capabilities that maybe only they know that hasn't been shared beyond their knowledge. It doesn't mean they're not willing to share it, although sometimes someone might like control of what they've developed and has not transferred it for that reason. We have to acknowledge that too. Um, but capturing and transferring knowledge to the next generation of succession that we see moving up into positions as people retire, um, as an easy example. In many cases, especially in rural agencies, this is the wave of what's coming in front of us. And the fifth major overview is we clearly want to make sure we're measuring and monitoring and evaluating the success of the overall plan that we've developed. So having laid out these five critical planning process steps, we're going to start to talk about them a little bit more. Last few thoughts about our industry as a whole and research that's been done on succession planning. Many of the senior leaders at our agencies entered the workforce somewhere in the 1970s to 1980s and how they looked at the work they do and the importance of it and their connection to our work. I know we've all learned in the coming generations that are being hired today, looks at their responsibility and their focus on the mission in a way that has developed and grown with younger generations coming in. And we want that direct connection to retain people and have them want to be part of our succession plan. 75% of people currently in working in transit are over 50 years old, 75% which is statistically a much higher number in transit than it is in the general population of retirees. And a third of you are planning to retire or know people who are planning to retire in the next five years. So to look at the long-term success of succession planning, it connects to our strategic plan if we have one currently. It's going to be something that does not sit on a shelf and just like strategic planning, this is gonna be a constant evaluation, especially if we have identified people in our succession plan and they're leaving, and we have to see, can we internally develop, or do, again, do we need to look outside the agency? Succession planning, depending upon how your board of directors is structured, also applies to your board of many 
of you have senior board members who have been there a long period of your history and you're wanting to go about having some kind of plan with your board about how do we approach board succession planning and then I identified what you expect which would be the top of the agency succession planning and then through senior leaders or key people in positions that we want to not only retain that's our whole focus but also transfer knowledge which is very critical as well so I think the easiest, simplest way to state what we're talking about with succession planning is it's a process. We're looking at developing talent to meet the needs of your transit agency for now, certainly, but you're doing a future look with succession planning that as much as possible, they, the senior leaders, are preparing someone for the future and they're going to help build their abilities and mentor or have other aspects to help develop that capability and i think the key part is is you're looking at building throughout your organization not solely at the senior level to retain good talent so the basics do start with this skills assessment and the responsibilities of positions and are our, again, are our job descriptions current? Are we breaking it down to show what competencies and capabilities are needed in the positions that we're looking and talking about with succession planning? And is that clearly something that's agreed upon by the senior leadership as to how things look today as much as what we're planning for in the future? Assessing skills that are needed and people currently in those positions and giving that voice in an ability to have senior leaders come together and have this kind of a discussion. Is it something, if those of you joining us right now are in senior leader positions, where you're agreeing with the overall perspective or are there other things you want to have added into these positions? In the future, might you say, which often happens with people who've been decades in a position, that this current person in this one position might even need that the position needs to be broken into two positions with responsibilities because perhaps you're not able to have anyone else internally, even externally at that level, get to that total knowledge and capability that one person from decades of work develop, and might we even at this time have to look in the future to having even it break into two positions titled a certain way. Many times, especially with the agency I worked with in Vermont, this is exactly what happened. They had a unique position, for example, direct, director of philanthropy, one of the rare transit agencies in the country that does a significant amount of philanthropy work and has funds that are given to the agency in that aspect. When I was working with them, we realized that that position could not be filled. The senior person who had been that director for over 30 years, they even agreed they would need to break down the position and have a new title to it and take that overall position from that level and break it out to be able to get people internally and even one aspect externally to fill that position. That's an easy example to give of something so unique that required that. And the same could occur in other areas. It might even be, as they decided, that the director of the agency that founded it and was had been there for 45 years um, required that they felt they needed to have a deputy transit director, a deputy director, excuse me, to the executive director, which they had never considered before, but realized in this rural community that many people would not be coming to and they did not have an internal candidate that they decided they wanted to break the position that way and have certain abilities and overseeing different aspects of the agency with having a deputy and developing a whole series of succession planning to have internally in the future someone who could move up even in an interim basis if the executive director couldn't work for a period of time or something like that. So assessments 
of skills and positions and where you are today can often lead to changes in that you see in the future that might be different than how currently identified. I don't think um, someone should be, I mean, I think we should be in a positive way realizing that could be the outcome. So looking at skills and the position requirements and where you are now and who's in the position is the starting point of what we're looking at. Again, not solely just executive director, but it's through senior leadership in an agency. I think the other key part to think of is if it's a position at the executive director level, and I'll focus there for a moment, now you're having the board of directors that are making a decision about hiring for that position. Whereas the, when you're looking at the rest of your senior, senior leadership, you know the work is being done internally with the staff and the general manager, or if you're large enough to have an HR, um, someone with that capability in the human resource side, um, that they are working internally for those positions in the rest of your leadership, as you would expect. But the you, oftentimes there's a committee of board members that are coming together to make that work about how to select the general manager position. And so oftentimes that's what is identified as a search committee when it's the board looking to hire for the general manager. And so when you're looking at a search committee like that, if you're fortunate, like I said, to have the ability to have a, an actual human resource person, I would recommend to the board that if they have those capabilities or can be trained on capabilities, certainly they're a key person to help coordinate and support the board in that work. Some boards decide they want to engage the current general manager in some capacities, of that search and some boards don't. It just depends upon the nature of the board and what they're looking for. If you don't have the ability within your organization and it's not there and it's time to hire a general manager, many times you will make a decision, the board will, to hire an outside agency to come in and take expertise that they have in succession and searches and bring them in. They often will, even when they have one or more internal candidates, as much as many boards decide, I still want to know externally what's out there as well, and they'll work and have some kind of an agreement with an outside organization. When working with an external company to look at the general manager position, those key five focus points of succession planning is good for the board to know so that when they sign an agreement and have a timeline, how long will this take? I'm often asked that for the director of a transit agency, what would be an acceptable timeline from the beginning of the process to the end of what it might take to conduct this search and hire the position? And I say the assessment again at the general manager level with the board's direct engagement and many times needing the support of people who know succession planning can take anywhere from three to six months on average. You would be thinking about it that way. So the most critical piece I feel that I have found for my work working with transit agencies is doing some kind of assessment of the competencies of the senior leaders. That's very critical. A success profile and that term, if you haven't seen it or worked with it before, is really an overview that's broken down below of what is the knowledge, skills, and abilities required for those senior leader positions. And ideally, do we have one candidate internally, even two, um, that we've identified based on these conversations that collectively the senior leaders are having? I think the important part I've learned from working with agencies doing this work, and we're even doing this at CTA with our succession plan, is if the candidates that you're identifying within those senior positions are working in other areas and not directly within that chain of command, I guess I'll call it, at this time, 
we want to retain people. We want to give them the opportunity for to be a part of this plan. And so that means having a conversation where someone understandably would say, oh no, I don't want someone to move over for maintenance to go to this area. They're a key person here. What do you mean that you're talking about succession planning in X area based on these skills? It's the conversation we have to have. What's the right thing, of course, for the overall organization, the mission? Then that key person in maintenance, as I took as an example, we now know, is there someone else internally in the agency or do we have to look externally when that person is developed and trained and getting ready to move over here somewhere else in operations, let's say. So this conversation being transparent and open and having someone overseeing it, if you have HR again, they can be supportive of it. If not, and you are small and we don't have that, Karen, oftentimes you're going to have to turn internally to your senior leadership and is it the general manager overseeing this or a combination of skill sets that are, but we have, we know we have to get ourselves there. So this profile of these documenting, putting it on paper, these knowledge, skills, and abilities needed, getting the input many times from long-term people, making no assumptions of what's required, and as much as possible, ideally one or two people. It is true that no one wants to go down a road of identifying people in their organization that they feel are meant to move in senior leadership positions or be developed in that and not ask them first if they're interested. That has happened before. Feeling that prior conversations have suggested to us or directly been said to us. And yet today, that might not be the same way that that person feels they want to be developed in that way. It's important legally, especially when we're talking about people retiring or potentially retiring, and this thinking of the federal law, the Age Discrimination Act, to not be directly saying, no matter how well you know someone, no matter how many decades you would work with them. So Karen, seems like you're coming to the time where you're thinking of retirement. No, <laughs> the approach has to be intentionally said along these lines. Karen, we're at the coming to the point where we're beginning a succession planning process. I know we're all describing to you what that means, but what it does mean is we're asking you to think, where do you see yourself in this organization in the next one to three years? Whatever answer I begin to give, maybe it's within the position I'm currently in. Maybe I'm thinking out loud with you. I want you to know it's open to the conversation. We want to know where do you see yourself? We'll share where we would like to see you too, but where do you see yourself is how you're not asking, so are you going to be retiring anytime soon? Hoping to start planning things around your retirement. And then I'm boxed in if I say something and I kind of come up with a general date. And what if I change my mind and I want to stay longer or I want to leave earlier? So we have to be sensitive to this. And so you can then say to me, and where do you see yourself then even more long-term, Karen? Do you see yourself in three to five years? Where would that be your vision of what we're doing at the organization? That's how when people say to me, but how do I get the idea when they might be turning or not? We cannot directly ask that question. Do not have yourself come into that circumstance. You instead ask one to three years or break down the timeline you want to. I usually say it that way three to five, anything more long-term. And it's not based on factors of age, retirement, not retiring or anything like that. It's just more about we're planning for the future and the, and the potential growth of the organization, new partnerships we might be having. You know, we want to make sure we have the right abilities here or develop those abilities. And that's how you go about approaching that um, because that's very critical in terms of your discussion. So, the next aspect is determining with those knowledge, skills, and abilities, are there places where you're missing something either in terms of a candidate overall, no one internally, and again, you're hoping to still be able to, in the discussions with your senior leaders, identify people who could be brought into getting their knowledge and skills brought up. But what it is called is a gap analysis. Where are there gaps? in looking at the whole organization and looking at leaders where we do not either have a person today or we do not see a person even with development of certain competencies and capabilities and development 
that will be able to come up and move into this position. We make sure we're documenting those gaps and we're constantly revisiting it. There might be a new hire you bring in, right? Uh, six months from now in another area, a certain position. And over time, because it's an ongoing succession plan, we're now, look, it seems like we're having going to have a conversation with them about where they want to be, where they see themselves, where we see them. So that's why the constant review of a succession plan, it's very regularly looked at. How regularly? Most agencies are looking at it at least on, at a minimum, every six months, some, some more frequently, depending upon the turnover. So we're going to see where there are gaps of skills or people to come into positions. And at that time where there are gaps, we might be thinking if tomorrow somebody who's currently in that position left just like that, we would have to go outside to hire it. And you know then you're going to have a process about how you go about outside hiring and you're allowing yourself to move along to get something that's already a plan and you're already ready to move into that plan. So I think it would make sense to all of us that that constant review allows to look at new people coming in or becoming aware of people who developed abilities in some ways that now has us ready to talk to them about that. So we're identifying those key competencies and talents and overall gonna have an analysis of where we are and also if there are gaps in that knowledge. I think the part that oftentimes has in the development of a succession plan when we are documenting and when I do this full training on succession planning, it's a, it's a full day training, um, the forms and tools and assessment tools that are being used um, are critical. We know to keep that ongoing documentation and discussion open. And when it comes to succession planning, when you're initially discussing it with your agency, communication and transparency is so key. We don't want anyone at all in any position, drivers, frontline supervisors, anywhere, to be misunderstanding why are we doing this work. So when it comes to an executive director, it's critical that the board of directors put a message out by email, if that's how you need to do it, attending some kind of all staff meeting, whatever way you want to communicate it, but your board members want to share with the agency that the time has come where we're starting to work on a plan to fill the position of the current director of the agency and what that does mean and identifying what the board is doing to look to fill that position. And if you have this process as part of your H human resource policies that say we always look internally first, if that's how yours are written, um, we analyze that capability. Then we also look externally and there's gonna be interviews ongoing. This is opening up everyone in the agency to know there's a process that's moving forward and the board is responsible for overseeing this process and what's engaged in that. So putting some kind of email, which in my class, I have an example of these emails that working with boards, we've structured to be transparent as to what's going on, to have everyone assured as to what's occurring. And the same thing when it comes to senior leadership development, identifying people interested and in that we're interested in and in getting those capabilities moving forward, we certainly want to everyone to know and be assured as to what succession planning means, what it means to have a process and what's occurring so that again, this isn't something under, misunderstood um, or it leads to unsurety, um, but instead it's a positive proactive way to keep our mission moving forward. I know this makes sense to all of us, but this has to start at the very beginning once we begin to come up with a process and the tools around this. So developing and of course, wanting to retain a, a pool and a talent pool of people that our assessment of the not KSAs, not knowledge, skills and abilities, our gap analysis, and looking at these senior leadership positions, sometimes even 
at the beginning of that assessment, you might even that early decide, and some agencies do, that we need to have other positions overall to develop capabilities and, like I said, break a job down into another one or add another tier in an organization. But we all know things only get done when we have a plan of action for every single person that we've identified. So those plan of actions often are, who are we going to mentor this person with? Is it one person or several to develop abilities where there's a gap or to further develop knowledge that we already agree is there to a certain level? but not ready yet to be at the senior leader level. So the key part of looking at, is there training that's going to be occurring, classes taken online or in person? Um, is there something where, again, we're mentoring and coaching someone, but there's definitely what you would expect, which is a plan of action where both the individuals being developed and the person responsible for the development are committing to each other steps that are going to be taken and ad identified and taken to develop that person's ability. Part of that plan of action is certainly monitoring and evaluating overall this plan. I will share with you that when someone is attending this full day training, this is something where throughout those different, all of you as different agencies, it's an extremely interactive in-person discussion. Some of you right now might say, we have a fully developed succession plan. The good news I hope is we're doing currently these steps, or we already had an outside firm we hired, or we internally managed it and came up with this plan and we're evaluating it and we're communicating it and we're doing all that good work that Karen's giving an overview of right now. And I know some of you are sitting here saying, again, we haven't done anything yet. That's why we're attending this to learn more and think of this in a very organized way. But either way, with the plan of action you're developing, it's something you're mutually getting specific about what's required to develop that candidate. And this is part of our overall look at retaining employees. Your importance, you've agreed you want to move up, you've agreed you want to develop these capabilities, and this is critical for our mission and your connection to our mission, uh, since that's the whole focus of the work that we do, is the mission and, and purpose for the work that we do. So allowing the candidates themselves to self-identify things is critical not just uh, our conversation of what we see but many people knowing they're a part of this process in ways you didn't even expect might off i find oftentimes identify i need help in this area i feel i need development in this area i never knew where to get it or how to approach it but you're going to find it's a great opportunity for people to say what they feel they need, not just what we've identified of uh, their abilities and skills. Uh, you would expect it, and it often is a very positive result of these conversations of things you thought someone was very good at, perhaps even, and they're saying they feel they need more. So the investment when you're looking from the operations finance side of budgets often means that your succession plan is also parallel budgeting, how do we in the future look at a job that's going to break into two? And what do I need to budget for salaries for those two jobs? If I'm hiring an external company to support the general manager position and we don't have the internal capability to do this, or we want to, even if we're doing succession planning, it's not just for the general manager. I don't want to suggest that. Some agencies very much want to have an outside organizational agency that knows succession planning, help them the first few rounds of doing this work, and then they step away and you take it over from there, which is understandable too. But your budgeting is definitely talking about, are, are we adding more positions and how do we budget for that? Are we hiring an external agency and budgeting for that? 
that critical forward planning, especially looking at a plan that might be fortunate that you don't have to have getting ready for senior leaders turning until one to three years gives you time to budget that way. But I didn't want to miss uh, that critical part of the budget process of what some of these results lead to when you're looking at succession planning. So the overall tool in this area is you're looking at the position, the title of the position, who the current person is, and hopefully one or two internal candidates that you're looking at. And at the highest level, the overview is focusing on if it's in a gap analysis, an external candidate, what would be the course of action if we had to fill that position as much as the internal candidate and what's the development plan of action that we're identifying. I think it's also a good discussion point that you're thinking, is there a high risk of someone leaving in this position? Again, based on discussions, does it appear they're retiring? And just at that highest level, like check a box to keep a nice overall structure on this. High performing and high potential employees and retaining them, we all know, is so critical when we're talking about our industry and the high level of turnover that's occurred through this time. Assessment of talent also means we're assessing the past performance, we're assessing currently, and overall we're looking at how that person's assessment in terms of their leadership competencies, we're assessing how they relate to our company's mission, we're assessing the advancement capabilities and developing those capabilities, as much as does that person want to be engaged in this. So as you're meeting as a leadership team and discussing succession planning, and the course of action and the timeline that it's going to take for each individual to develop them and their engagement in that. All those different assessments are talking about who's qualified, who do, who do we see in these positions in the future, and ensuring that if we're adding new positions or not needing that capability, that the job descriptions I'm summarizing here are meeting all those requirements for the talent and capabilities for our agency in this successful overview. So the leadership team, as you would expect, you as a team are very critical in how you assess where your position is today and how you develop future talent, including, again, potentially people who are working in another area, perhaps coming over because that's the right thing in terms of meeting the requirements for those positions. Once you've completed that development plan and have that course put together, the one really essential pieces, capturing the knowledge of the person or persons in the positions now and ensuring the transfer of knowledge. There could be that new software system that was developed that only one person developed it internally and do enough people know how that works? Does that person in the past felt I'm the one who needs to know, I'm the one responsible and hasn't opened up the gateway to have others come to know it. Sometimes those harder conversations need to be held as to why we're doing this and it's within a succession plan. If right now I asked you to think of, not by title of position, but if I had you write down on a piece of paper today, three key positions where if people gave you a one week notice and said, I have to leave. Maybe it's a medical emergency, a family emergency, whatever it is. And you said, oh no, is your response. 
What are we going to do? They're the only one who knows this. They're the only one who's worked with that or the whole team and how they function so well together. This will be devastating to them. This is the support when people might be unsure, especially people in a position a long time. I don't quite get why we need this. I'm not sure. We don't want to be in a position where someone as good as you and what you've developed in design is lost and has to be reworked again. It's not for the greater good of what you as the leader of this team and your whole team has worked to develop. So reviewing expected positions where vacancies are coming in one, two, three years, or even longer, and acknowledging among your leadership as of that time and with constant review what you see, and capturing that knowledge and having it get transferred. It's really about how we plan for that and that's what you're working on. I would share definitely, we are looking to reduce the loss of your institutional knowledge, Karen. Um, your contributions and what you've developed, look at how we function. We could Let's talk back about where things started and where things are now. We want to make sure that we're always able to take that great work that's been done and move that knowledge into others and we don't plan to wait on that. We're planning to make sure we're preparing for the future and your importance in that. So taking that knowledge and looking at that knowledge and the transfer of that often means if you have the time that you're in a six month really plan of activities when everything's beginning. Again, you're assessing current and future leadership. You're identifying critical positions requiring these high, highly capable employees. You're doing this analysis overall of your current talent and where there are gaps in that talent. You're identifying, are there other positions we're going to have to add to support this when this knowledgeable person leaves? or for other reasons you choose to add that. You're looking at competencies required for those key positions. You're analyzing as you hear as a whole, the overall view of the staff at all levels. When I work with the agency in Vermont, they went back and they looked at all the people who were driving for them and realized a couple of their drivers, they did have frontline supervisors and they said, we need to have conversations. They identified several key people and they said, moving to be frontline supervisors. And we have never had that conversation. Internally, we've known they have the ability, but we never formally discussed it. And having those discussions, in their case, it led to developing one more frontline supervisor. And instead of waiting X amount of time, they recognized the need was now. That was their end discussion. And so they worked about having a plan and a very strategic, quick turnaround of several months to move people up to frontline supervisors, knowing there'd be a gap in drivers, our dreaded and hard work that we're doing in trying to recruit and retain drivers. But understandably, they said, we need to get those key frontline people there and we need to go ahead and fill in the driver positions. We'd rather do that than lose them overall, which especially for one person, they were concerned about that. So as you're taking those tasks and those plans and identifying those skills and competencies, the ongoing timeline and what you're aiming for is to ensure a smooth transition at all levels of leadership. Those smooth levels of transition that we're looking at here are really the point of saying that we're going to have a method to continue this review and we're going to make sure that the, cast, the accountability goes throughout the agency to ensure to meet our strategic goals, which a succession planning is. What I think you're, we all will find realistically is this open discussion about plans and movement within an organization to certain positions and responsibilities is again, a, a long-term plan to retain good people. 
And it creates more of a teamwork mindset on that is a result of this is what you should expect. Um, and it also brings about a mutual respect. Your work and your contributions in your position is something that we're identifying and seeing and want you to be a part of as much as how we see you from leadership and how we're sharing that with you. So it's bringing forward the capabilities. And this is what many times I hear about the turnover of senior leaders that often are at what was identified as a baby boomer level and bringing in people of different generations and diversity and opinions in our agencies and saying that their capabilities are also something because most younger people are saying, even with the turnover and the hard times we're in now, they want to work with an organization that's mission focused and they're a part of that mission. That's often what my everyday review, every day um, as a human resource director as to what's being said in transit and in the field and who's being hired, that mission and purpose matter. And you're directly engaging in that when it's succession planning. So this discussion, this review, this acting on, and everybody's part in this is really meant to come to the point where when either it's the senior leader as the general manager, anybody at the senior leadership we know wants to have a really great exit. <laughs> you know, they want to say to themselves, I enlisted the support of leaders in the organization. I worked with the board of directors. We worked with each other in agreeing to this overall plan. Again, the board's working to hire the general manager, and it's still, of course, within the roles and responsibilities that the rest of it and the staff development is all done by the leadership of the senior team. And at the end of that, these process points that I mentioned earlier allow us to get to the point of saying, I can exit as a senior leader or I can exit the general manager and say, the critical difference was us connecting in a way that was open and transparent and allowed us these plans to really have the outcome we all want, which is it's really the right way to have everything stay on an even easy keel and help us achieve what we want to in our work. There are times I'll highlight just real quickly mistakes that can sabotage a succession plan before I open up to questions. And I think it's important to identify that because that can occur as well. And that's realistic too. If we're not making succession planning a priority and we're not developing a full plan that engages and involves our entire leadership and workforce, then we don't have the support that's needed to bring a plan forward. Communicating why we're doing this as this plan and certainly engaging this plan and review to keep the plan alive is key. So I want us to all think in your consideration of if you're saying the time is clear, there's a reason I want to do this work and bring forward succession planning as part of our agency's work. I think then I'll say in the words of Dr. Seuss for a fun conclusion, as Dr. Seuss used to say, don't cry because it's over. I want to walk out the door smiling saying, it's all good because we work together to make it happen. I think perhaps there might be questions or anything that might come forward for us. Yeah, Karen, first of all, thanks so much um, for that overview. It's, it's just fantastic and um, great resource for the people we have on today and, and going forward uh, with the recording of today's event. Um, I, I know one question that we got is, you know, in terms of what succession planning looks like, I mean, you've laid out really well what the main ingredients are. Are there different levels of succession planning that an organization can take on like succession planning light versus all the way, you know, in the deep end, 
and can it be effective or is this sort of an all or nothing prospect? My opinion of working with this, um, and, and we know that's an opinion, is this is part of your retention. And so I feel overall, some people said, I'm going to stop at the general manager level, Karen, and, and work with the board and we're going to do all this or um, the, the time it's where that I can do this technical work myself all the way through the whole plan. I wish I had more time, but I can't. But what I didn't I do know is I don't encourage stopping at that point, clearly, in, in discussing this overview. Um, but some have said to me that, and I understand that's the decision, you know, they choose to make. It's so critical to say, how do we ensure we're directly doing work that's a plan of action to develop people and retain them, means that we have to have these assessment tools, and there are definitely tools to support this work, that you're completing and doing as a leadership team. Many times, I think if you think of it in terms of light, maybe a light approach I'm guessing might be, we'll stop at the very senior level of leadership, whatever that title is, and we won't go further. But then I'm wondering, how are you then identifying candidates and other positions in the whole tier of your organization to develop and mentor and get those skills and training abilities to move up? Otherwise, you're re responding instead in a kind of crisis critical kind of approach. And, and we all know nobody wants to be in that, you know, in that way of having to respond that way. So I suppose light might be starting at stopping a general manager and not doing that below, or maybe it's senior leaders. But I, I really think you're missing seeing who else in your agency could be you're really focusing on retaining and actively working with them and transparently engaging as to their importance and work within it and what they should be doing and what you could be doing. I think you're missing that opportunity, quite frankly. Sure. That's, that's how I feel anyway. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think one more question, you know, you, you talked about Vermont, um, you work yes. at that agency. Are there, um, you know, case studies out there, successful case studies, I guess, that, that you can point to transit agency or, you know, transit sector or otherwise that, that people can look at. And I know you kind of touched on this already, but, you know, in terms of success versus failure, you know, what maybe some of those um, biggest challenges are for organizations that are, you know, looking to take this on and how to, you know, overcome them generally. So I have to tell you, in all my research I've, I've done, there isn't anything identified. There hasn't been anything TCRP, TRB, anyone has done in that area to have something formally promulgated that I could say to connect to. Um, my development, even though with my human resource background and, and uh, when I worked in the private sector, many of you know, because I've trained in, with Missouri and many of you had, were here back in time when, when we did the driver recruitment and retention training and my background in HR, um, I was taking all those skills and spent a solid six months doing research across the private sector, nonprofit, government, and all this work around it to gather all this knowledge base before I went to Vermont and did that work. They wanted somebody with transit background. They wanted it more relatable than a generalist in terms of the world of companies to hire and succession planning, which made sense to their board, and that was their focus. And I understood and appreciated it when I uh, got to saying yes to uh, you know, set aside time and do that work. I knew that was critical to them. And I think we all understand, ideally that would be what we always want. So I wish I could say easily, there's something that I could direct you to. Now, the reason that I was mentioning this is an in-person training and not virtual in the full day is the interaction I have found in doing this class, like I taught it at Expo this year, and even these brief overviews is, very open and critical that a lot of people are talking about authentically either some progress they've made in this, something they've started, or even agencies that completed succession plans. When I gave them tools, they said, oh, we didn't analyze this. We didn't do this. I'm glad you gave us this, Karen. We have to go back. They said, just like you said, we're always revisiting. We're always seeing what else is out there. So I don't have the best news on that at this time. There is um, work that I'm putting together to do some kind of a little more of a white paper on that, but that's not being released in, in an immediate time frame. But I feel the industry's sake, because there's such a gap, 
boy, is there a gap on this. And many people are at this critical point, as we know, especially rural agencies, for many of them having one dedicated leader that's been there for a long period of time. And, and I, nobody wants to be panicked on that. And you want to be very process and systematic about the engagement in that. We all do. Um, we can see this takes time. And that's why I say allowing one to three months for solid work on this, then it's easy to go back and keep reviewing that and having different leaders take different pieces and own it and say, I'm going to do it more frequently in my area, you know, or I don't need it as regularly. I mean, you can get into all those discussions as you would expect. Yeah, no, I mean, and that, that makes sense. And, and I want to give you, I guess, one opportunity at the end here, if there's, if you've got sort of one take home for everybody, um, you know, I think you've, you've laid out in the beginning, um, how critical this is, especially for the transit sector and the, the need is there. And I'm assuming that you're seeing a lot of organizations trying to figure out, you know, what the next step is here. So yes. um, many, many, many are reaching out, out to me exactly about that. Um, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, one big take home for everybody to, to kind of chew on. I would say that I guarantee this has been weighing on a lot of people's minds and senior leadership. It's not been discussed maybe in terms of this term succession planning or formally, but I have no doubt almost every general manager is saying, I'm very concerned about how this goes. So my takeaway would be to engage your leadership, open the conversation and say, let's plan for success. Let's plan for an outcome where we're controlling it instead of reacting to it. We want to be the ones to say, we're leading this and now I know there's a process to help us get there. Well, that's great. I, I really appreciate, um, and our association appreciates your time this morning, Karen. Um, this is a, a really valuable um, presentation and, and resource. And uh, you know, I'm sure that we'll have you know, more people reaching out uh, as they look to take the next steps. Sure. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for joining us this morning. Um, we will make this recording available um, to the members following this event. Uh, be on the lookout um, at our website for future education series events that we have planned. We have another one kind of focused on a similar topic, succession planning from sort of the frontline worker perspective coming up later in September. Um, we've got our uh, big Midwest transit conference coming up September 6th through the 8th. And as always, any ideas that you have for future um, education resources that you want, please reach out. Uh, Karen, thanks again. Thank you so much for inviting me. Appreciate it so much and look forward to talking with you again. Have a good All rest right. of the day, everyone. Bye. Thanks now. so much. Have a great day, everybody.